to talk about Clara Schumann. We really do. The reason why I didn't make a video last week was because I tried to sit down and do a bunch of research on Clara Schumann and then realized there is like way too much information on this woman and her life. Um, so like I needed like a little extra time and I still uh, put it off and procrastinated as I have a tendency to do. But I finally gathered all my information on her um, for just a brief overview of this wonderful woman's life because there is so much about her life. Like I, I wanted to make a whole video on my channel dedicated to Clara Schumann and the wonderful person that she is, the wonderful human being that she is, um, just because her life story, man, which we will get into, is so amazing. But as I talk about Clara in this video, as you will see, it's nearly impossible to talk about just Clara Schumann. Um, not only because her husband was also a famous composer, but just the composers of this time period were a very like tightly knit community. They often bumped into each other and interacted with each other and you know, they were they were all co-workers. And so it's some it's often hard to tell just one composer's story. Um, especially if you, you would, might know that if you watch my War of the Romantics video. Um, they, they often had interactions with each other all the time and they overlapped in each other's life stories, often at like key crucial moments. Um, so yeah, so we'll talk about a couple other composers, but the bulk of this is dedicated to Clara Schumann. So, who was Clara Schumann? Why was she so cool? Why do we need to talk about her? Well, Clara Schumann, born Clara Wieck, was born on September 13th, 1819. Uh, her father and her mother were both musicians. Her father went to school to study um, being like a pastor, essentially, and uh, went through schooling for that and then kind of realized that wasn't the thing he wanted to do, it didn't really work out for him. So he turned to his next best skill, which was playing the piano. Clara's mother was a soprano singer and actually they both played piano and were piano tutors at some point in time. However, Clara's parents split right before she turned five years old. And then when Clara did turn five, she was under her father's care completely and wasn't really allowed to see her mother. So from the age of five, Clara's father raised her to become a pianist. So Clara performed piano and she performed it very, very well. She was really, really talented in piano. So Vic then began to push his daughter towards the performance end of music. And when I say push her towards music, I mean become an overbearing father figure. From everything that I read about Vic, there is very little that seems positive about him. He was a very strict and demanding father and often had a tendency to just helicopter parent and control everything that Clara was doing. At seven years old, he gave his daughter a diary to write in, but would often write in the diary alongside her, either pretending to be her and writing from her perspective and would write additional notes in there, or would write things in his own voice in the side margins, correcting whatever Clara had written in there. So, he, and he went through it constantly. He read everything that she wrote, and so it wasn't really truly her own diary. It was more a way that Vic could supervise his daughter in what she was doing. At nine years old, Clara made her first performance debut at the Leipzig Gewandhaus, and she performed to great success. Everybody loved her, and she was a really good pianist. She was becoming a child prodigy. In this same year, this is also the year she happened to meet Robert, her soon to be future husband. Well, soon to be within like nine plus years or so, you know, she's not going to get married at nine years old. It was after this point that Robert actually took lessons from Clara's father and even to the point where he stayed with the Veeks for a while and interacted with the children and had interactions with Clara. Also during her childhood, Clara did a lot of composing. She wasn't like a crazy big composer. She didn't have a lot of pieces like other child prodigies like Mozart did, but she did compose some. So Clara performed a lot and her father took her all around Europe touring over and over and over again where she received critical acclaim. One quote I have from the General Music Journal writes about her, even in her first piece, the artist who is still so young received thunderous applause that grew more enthusiastic with each piece she played. 
and indeed, the great skill, assurance, and strength with which she plays even the most difficult movements is highly remarkable. Even more remarkable is the spirit and feeling of her performance. One could scarcely wish for more." So people really thought that Clara did wonderful. She was truly an amazing pianist, and she received high critical acclaim seemingly everywhere that she went. While she was on tour, her father acted as her concert manager, planning and setting up every single concert that she would go to, as well as managing the money that she earned as income from her concerts. But of course, her father being the overbearing figure that he was, he kept a lot of the money for himself, feeling that it was kind of his earning and his right since he was the one that taught his daughter how to play and how to perform and was the one that managed everything for her. And eventually later on in her life, Clara would have to try to sue her father to get the money back. It was also during this time, during her tourings, that she ran into a lot of professional acquaintances and made a lot of friends with, like I said, many other contemporary composers. It's where she met people like Chopin, Mendelssohn, and even Liszt. But, of course, as we all know, the most influential composer in Clara's life was her soon-to-be husband, Robert. So, in 1837, when Clara was 18 and Robert was 27, he proposed to her, and of course she immediately accepted. Um, but then Robert turned around and asked her father's permission, and her father didn't really like Robert so much, so he declined. He kind of felt that with Robert being a composer that he was going to have a very unstable life and he felt that that wasn't a good providing position for his daughter, despite the fact that he himself was a music tutor and his daughter made a lot of money touring and performing, he just didn't really like Robert so much and didn't really feel like he was going to be a good fit for his daughter. So he straight up refused to allow his daughter to get married to Robert. But Clara clearly took after her father's stubborn spirit and was determined to make this marriage work with Robert, so they took it to court. They took it to court and decided to sue Clara's father to force him to allow the marriage, or at least have the court systems kind of supersede Clara's father's authority. Because of how the laws worked at the time, Clara was just a little bit too young to get married without her father's permission. She needed to be 21 and she was 18 at the time. So it was a long and arduous process, uh, but eventually they won the case. So Clara and Robert got married, funnily enough, the day before she turned 21, when she would have received the full rights without her father's permission. And if you know even a little bit about Robert and Clara, you will know that they actually had a very functional and loving relationship. Everything that I can find about reading about the two of these, it, it really didn't seem like to be a bad marriage at all. And even after getting married, Clara didn't back down from continuing to be the musician she had always been. She and Robert went on several different tours together and would perform together. However, Clara did seem to prioritize more of Robert's composing over more of hers. This wasn't really necessarily a thing that like Robert enforced on her, it seems more so a thing Clara kind of did for herself. She emphasized Robert's accomplishments a little bit more so over her own. They would go and tour, but when Robert wouldn't feel well or when Robert didn't really necessarily feel like it as strongly, then she would take breaks a little bit more often. She would stop practicing in the home from time to time if she felt like Robert needed space to sit down and compose, and she really acted more as a supporting role to her husband. That is not to say that Clara stopped being a very strong woman, because she certainly wasn't. A great example of this is in 1849 during the Dresden Revolution. Robert and Clara happened to be in Dresden at the time. They heard the alarm bells ringing in the distance and knew that the revolution was coming, so they decided to get out of Dodge and they took their oldest daughter, Marie, along with them. However, as soon as Robert and Clara and Marie were all out of the city, they still had three children that were being left with a maid in Dresden in the city. So Clara Schumann, seven months pregnant, 
walks on foot almost all the way back to the entire city to rescue her three remaining children. Meek and mild, this woman is not. And it, she, she is, I, I, I can't imagine doing that. Like seriously, like there's war on the verge of breaking out and you're seven months pregnant and you just walk back and rescue your three remaining children because you care about your family that much. I, I just, ugh. This is, this is why, this is why I love this woman so much. So she's a good mother, she's a good wife, and she still continues performing and being an amazing, phenomenal musician. And it's honestly, especially during their marriage, you really can't talk about Clara without also talking about Robert, and vice versa, you can't talk about Robert without also mentioning Clara. They really were acting as this dynamic duo, and you couldn't really separate them from each other. Throughout their lifetime, they also met other notable composers, one of the biggest influences of which ended up being Johannes Brahms. In fact, the Schumanns were kind of the reason why Brahms ended up being as big as he was. He was initially sort of discovered by Josef Joachim, who recommended Brahms go meet the Schumanns, and that was an excellent idea for everyone involved. Brahms and the Schumanns really hit it off, and they became very, very close friends. In fact, Brahms ended up being a really good friend for Clara, especially when Robert's health started to decline towards the end of his life. Speaking of which is sort of the next chapter we reach in Clara's life. Now, beyond his compositions, one of the other big things that is notable that happens in Robert's life is that he really struggles with a lot of mental health issues. Depression really seemed to run in Robert's family, and he had several other family members that suffered from it. Now, in the beginning of their marriage, Robert didn't show too many signs of dealing with mental health issues, but as time went on, he seemed to suffer more and more. And unfortunately, this really happened during a time when mental health was not understood at all. In fact, the year that Robert Schumann died was actually the year that Freud, the father of psychology, was born. So it wasn't going to come around for some time. So the mental health struggles that Robert went through really didn't have any good solutions. And in 1854, Robert attempted to take his own life by throwing himself off a bridge into the Rhine River. Fortunately, he was rescued by some passing fishermen. He was pulled out of the Rhine River, and Robert realized he needed to go to a mental institution. And a few days later, a carriage came and took him off to the mental institution. Now, at this time, Clara had seven children she had to take care of. She still had to go on and take care of the rest of her family. And in terms of going and seeing her husband, the doctors, for some reason, recommended against it. They felt like it wasn't going to be good for Robert's health. And so Clara herself was sort of forbidden from going and seeing her husband, even though people like Brahms and other family members could go and visit Robert for her. Clara was sort of forced to stay back and take care of the rest of the family. But she continued doing what she had always done, which was touring and performing and taking care of the household whenever she was not out. She had friends, like I said, Brahms was one of the significant ones, as well as many other personal friends who would watch her children for her or take care of the household, and they had maids, they had cooks, they had people who could help, and of course Clara's eldest daughter was also a significant help during this period of time. For two and a half years, Robert was in this mental institution. It wasn't until two days before his death that Clara was finally allowed to go in and see him. His mental state had completely deteriorated. He seemed to recognize Clara, but really didn't talk much at all. It isn't really well known what specific mental illness Robert suffered from. There are lots of theories that have been floated around out there. It's also not super clear as to what he specifically died from, if it was complications from something else, or if he died of maybe like a disease that he caught while he was in the institution. 
But regardless, in 1856, Robert passed away while in the mental institution. But of course, Clara had to continue on. She had seven children relying on her, one of whom was born while Robert was in the mental institution. And like I said before, she continued doing what she had always done. And she was still an amazing performer. She toured around with other famous musicians and she was widely renowned for her skills on the piano. She didn't compose as much during this time period in her life. She really slowed down while she was married and to the point where she nearly essentially stopped composing after Robert had died. However, she spent a lot of time instead putting out a lot of music that Robert had been working on. And Clara really stayed that skilled performer that she had always been known as ever since she was a child. And in fact, she became so renowned in her skill that multiple conservatories begged her and offered her positions to work and tutor at their conservatories, at places like Stuttgart, Hanover, and Berlin. They all offered her permanent teaching positions. Basically, Clara had her pick of the litter. She could go anywhere she wanted and have a really good, steady, stable career. And so because of this, she was able to negotiate an amazing contract because she had several conditions that she wanted to have met if she was going to accept a tutoring position somewhere. So in 1878, she agreed to the position at, from Dr. Hoch Conservatory at Frankfurt on Main because they agreed to her conditions of limiting her teaching time to an hour and a half per day, um, allowing her to tutor from home. She was allowed four months off of vacation per year in addition to allowing periods of time off during the winter where she could do short tours. And she was allowed to have two assistant teachers who she chose to be Marie and Eugenie, which were her two daughters. All of this was for a salary of $2,000 or in today's terms, about 43,000 euros per year. What, what an amazing gig she's got going on there. And if she's not even working that much. So she's clearly like also making money off of her tours that she's doing elsewhere. So just like, can you imagine being that skilled and like that, like that's what you negotiate for? Like by today's standards, that's an amazing deal. That's an amazing deal to negotiate out. I mean, it sounds like probably less than what professors would be paid. But number one, she's not working as much. And number two, like money doesn't always translate well from back then into now. So that's, that's a good deal. <laughs> and so Clara continued tutoring, teaching, performing and touring all the way up and towards the end of her life. Towards the end of her life, Clara unfortunately became increasingly deaf, which is hard for a musician. I mean, ask Beethoven, right? And so she, pull back on a lot of her touring, but she continued a significant amount of it right up until the end. In 1891, she performed her last public performance. And on May 20th, 1896, Clara Schumann passed away from a stroke. She was buried in the old cemetery in Bonn next to, of course, her husband. So yeah, this woman had an amazing, uh, just legacy of a life. Now, I think here comes the more interesting question. Why don't we talk about Clara as much, specifically like in comparison to her husband, Robert, who clearly was as equal as she was in terms of the music realm. And I think that comes down to mostly a question of, well, what kind of realm are we talking about? When we're talking about music history, most of the time we're talking about the music that was composed. And if you look at the list of compositions that Clara Schumann has written, majority of it was in her childhood, and it's not quite the long extensive list compared to many of her other contemporaries. So I think with that, the reason why we don't talk about Clara as much is because she was much more of a performer than she was a composer. She composed because she knew how to compose and she was skilled at composing, but that doesn't really seem to be as much her thing as touring and playing and performing really were for her. And when we're talking about music history, unless we're talking about the history of famous performers, because that is a whole different kind of realm, 
then we're not going to talk about Clara Schumann as much. But if we talk about famous performers in music history, we are going to talk about Clara Schumann much more than her husband because her husband honestly was not as as far as I can tell it kind of feels like maybe Robert was the less accomplished pianist between the two of them and so if we're going to talk about famous performers and prominent performers and significant performers Clara Schumann is going to be much 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 higher on that list uh, probably more comparable to list Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> uh. But I think so often when we talk about music history, we just talk about the music. We just talk about the composers. We just talk about whatever is on the sheet of paper in front of us. And there's so much more to it than just the music itself. There's a lot more people behind it. And so if we're only just looking at what's on the sheet of paper with the music, it's it makes more sense why we would accidentally overlook people like Clara Schumann. She's not as much a composer, she is far more the performer. On the other hand, her husband Robert is much more of a composer than he is a performer. So in that realm, we're going to talk about Robert more than we're going to talk about Clara. But they're both amazing people. They're a dynamic duo with so much relationship goals there. I, I can't even, I, I didn't even scratch the surface of the two of them. I, I barely got into that at all. They are truly a fascinating people, honestly. Um, so yeah, that's my, now, now we have talked about Clara Schumann. So check that one off your list. Um, so yeah, if you like this video, you'd like to see more of it, feel free to subscribe. Sub what is that? Subscribe, subscribe subscribe I don't subscribe to the channel um yeah and otherwise I will see you next time goodbye